Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images of people who have died. On the 11th of November 1918, the First World War was brought to a close. Now, 100 years on, we're taking a special look back at this momentous event and how it changed Australia forever. Hi, my name's Amelia Mosley. Thanks for joining me for this very special episode marking the 100th anniversary of the armistice that brought an end to World War I. Throughout today's show, we'll find out how peace was actually negotiated, see the reaction to the news both here and overseas, and we'll discover what kids are doing to commemorate the date today. You'll see all that and more soon. But first, let's go back to find out what caused World War I in the first place. It was a war that changed the world forever. But it may never have started had it not been for this guy, Gavrilo Princep. On June 28, 1914, he assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, and it started a massive chain reaction. Austria declared war on Serbia, and countries supporting both sides came to help. Suddenly, a small war became a big one. On one side were the Allies, including countries like France, Britain and Russia. On the other were the Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, which is now Turkey. At the time, Australia was still a member of the British Empire, so they were part of the Allies. No time was wasted in 14. Up and away to war. The word went Anywhere. out for volunteers, and more than 400,000 young men enlisted. Some young teenagers also wanted to fight, so they lied about their age to get in. On April 25, 1915, Australian and New Zealand soldiers, by then known as the Anzacs, landed at Gallipoli. More than 50,000 Australians fought in the eight-month-long campaign. It's remembered as the first real battle we took part in as a nation. But most of the fighting didn't happen here. It happened on the Western Front in France. From 1914 until the end of the war, both sides dug and fought from large trench and dugout systems. Trenches helped protect soldiers from guns and artillery, but life could be tough. A big threat was disease. The trenches weren't clean, there wasn't much medical help, and at times it got really cold. Many soldiers died because of the conditions they lived in and the spread of disease. As the war went on, more technology was designed to break the deadlock. The first fighter planes battled over the trenches, while bombers made raids behind enemy lines. The first ever tanks hit the front lines to combat trench warfare. There was now fighting on the ground, in the air and at sea. In April 1917, America entered the war, assisting the Allies. Hundreds of thousands of troops flooded the front lines. By early 1918, Germany and its allies had defeated Russia on the Eastern Front and made a big push in France. But Germany's attack failed. The Allies mounted their own offensive, retaking territory from Germany. The tide was turning. OK, now throughout today's show, we'll also be testing your knowledge about World War I with a quiz. There will be 15 questions all up. I'll give you the answers after each one. Here's the first five. OK, question one. How long was World War I? Was it two years, four years or six years? The answer is four years. Question two. Where was most of the fighting? Was it here in Europe or here in Africa? The answer is Europe. Question three. Were aeroplanes used in World War I? Yes, 
they were, even though they hadn't been long invented. Here's a look at some of the models used. Now to question four, what were the names of the two sides that took part? They were the Allied and Central Powers. And question five, how many Australian nurses volunteered to serve? Was it 50, 900 or 3,000? The answer is 3,000 nurses. Now, after four years of fighting, an armistice was finally declared on the 11th of November 1918. But how was such a tricky agreement negotiated? Here's the full story. It wasn't a fighter plane, a tank or a battleship that spelled the end of the First World War, but a signature in a train carriage made on November 11th, 1918. By the second half of 1918, Germany was in big trouble. It had defeated Russia, but it was losing in France. German forces were being pushed back, and its leaders no longer believed they could win the war. Defeat was coming. One by one, Germany's allies, including Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire, and Austria-Hungary, pulled out of the fighting and signed formal agreements to stop the conflict. That's called an armistice, and Germany was ready to sign one too. The Allies, led by Marshal Ferdinand Foch, came up with the agreement. It called for fighting to end, for Germany to evacuate, hand over all of its weapons, and return its prisoners. Germany signed it on the 11th of November 1918, in General Foch's railway carriage, with the armistice officially coming into effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day, of the 11th month. It would be the end of fighting, for a while at least. In the coming years, Germany would be forced to sign more treaties, including the Treaty of Versailles, which officially blamed Germany for the war and forced it to make big repayments to the Allies. Many historians think those terms played a big part in the rise of Hitler's Germany and the start of World War II, just 20 years later. But at the time, everyone was ready for the Great War to end. News spread that the war was over. Queensland Government Gazette, Germany has signed the armistice with the Allies and that consequently the war that has devastated the world for more than four years is at an end. The guns fell silent, and on the front lines, troops cheered and danced. In London, in Paris, in New York, people celebrated too. After more than four years of conflict, war was finally over. Do you have more questions about the armistice? Ask me live on Friday during Ask a Reporter. Head to our website for the details. Now, as you've seen, World War I had a massive impact on Australia, even though it was fought on the other side of the world. So how did such a young nation recover from the loss of so many? Take a look. <laughs> Polly, Mayer and Mackenzie have been learning about their great, great, sometimes even great, great, great relatives who fought in the Great War. My great, great grandpa's name was Douglas Guthrie. Um, he was a private in World War One, and he enlisted when he was 21. He got captured as a prisoner of war. When I first saw this photo, I thought he looked really brave. For Maya, it was her great-great-great-uncle, who she discovered was Indigenous Australian. His name was Edward Heath, and he was 30 when he enlisted. I think he felt really um, brave going to war. 
because he was probably trying to prove that Aboriginals can do what white people can do and they shouldn't be treated any differently just because they're a different colour. These are his dog tags that he wore. And for Mackenzie, it was her great-great-grandpa, but he was actually British fighting alongside Australians. My great-great-grandpa was George Thomas Bridenden. He joined the Royal Garrison Artillery as a gunner um, in 1914. It was 30 when World War I started. And he said that his scariest experience was um, running new telephone wires to the front trenches after the old ones had been blown up. Polly and Maya's relatives are two of the more than 400,000 Australian men who enlisted in World War I. By the time the war ended, around 60,000 of those men had died, and about 170,000 of them were left wounded or ill. It wasn't actually until 1919, months and months after the war ended, that troops finally started coming home. But it wasn't easy for many soldiers and nurses to forget what they'd lived through. It would be hard to just get back from the war and go on with normal life because you've got the memories and the wounds and all the injuries and stuff. While Polly's great-great-grandpa made it home to New South Wales after being taken prisoner in Germany, he was left permanently injured. It was before the war that this was taken because after the war he had those three fingers amputated off. Australia had to work out some ways to help the survivors, the wounded, the war widows and their families to recover. So the government decided to offer free medical care, pensions and places to live to permanently injured or sick service people. And carnivals and parades were held to raise money for them. Whole organisations were even created to defend war veterans' rights and help them get back to normal life. You've probably heard of the Returned and Services League, or RSL, that still exists today. There were other struggles the country had to face too. Many Australian industries weren't doing so well, people didn't have as much money, and jobs were way harder to find. So programs were created to help returned soldiers learn new skills, like construction, mechanics, or even haircutting. And farming too. In fact, state governments offered some soldiers a small piece of land to farm if they wanted to. The war touched so many lives in so many different ways, but while it wasn't easy, many of them were able to get through it. My great-great-grandfather, he used to live behind a shop when he was a child, so they went back there and they started it as a shop. And then they had four children, all boys, and the youngest one was my great-grandfather. After the war, he would have gone back to England um, and had a family, and then his grandson, my grandfather, was the first person in our family to go to, to come to Australia. I think it's important to remember them because they did so much for our country and lots of people fought and didn't survive very long and they've helped us go on to have what we have today. Time for the quiz again now. Question six. What time was the armistice declared? Was it at midnight, 11am or 1pm? The answer is 11am. Question seven. What is an armistice? Is it an agreement to hand over arms, delay fighting for a week or end fighting? An armistice is an agreement to end fighting. Question eight. 
How many minutes of silence were originally held to mark the anniversary? Was it one, two or five? The answer is two minutes. Question nine now, which instrument is the last post played on? Is it the clarinet, the bugle or the saxophone? It's played on the bugle. And question 10, what is the age of the youngest Australian soldier on the Roll of Honour for World War I? The answer is 14 years and nine months old. His name was James Martin. All right, these days we all know the 11th of November is Remembrance Day, but it hasn't always been called that, and the way it's commemorated has also changed over the years. Let's find out how. The community of Bridgewater in the Adelaide Hills has never had a proper war memorial. So these kids and others from the local school decided to design and build a new one. After five long years of work, it's now nearly finished. Can you tell me what is left to do? Um, well, there's going to be a boomerang with a rising sun just at the back, okay. and then a sign with Remember on it down at the front, and some fences and some pavers, but that's about it, really. The boomerang with the rising sun, what does that mean? Um, that symbolises that all Australians were part of the war, Memorials and monuments like this one are a common feature of Remembrance Day commemorations right around the world. At 11am on the 11th day of the 11th month, people gather at places like the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne or the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. They stand still and silent and then listen to a bugler playing the last post. have been marking Remembrance Day like this since 1919, but back then it was actually called Armistice Day because it marked the anniversary of the day the armistice was signed and the First World War finally ended. November the 11th, Armistice Day. At the time, hundreds of people gathered in London to celebrate the end of the conflict and to remember those who died. People did the same here in Australia. The tradition of silence on Remembrance Day was actually suggested by an Aussie journalist called Edward Honey. He thought it'd be a sacred gesture to acknowledge those who died fighting for peace. Britain's king at the time, King George V, liked the idea and declared two minute silence across the British Empire. Since the first armistice ceremony, people have added new traditions to the commemorations, like wearing red poppies. That was inspired by a poem called In Flanders Fields, which describes the poppies that sprung up on abandoned battlefields in France and Belgium. Later on in 1945, when World War II ended, the Australian and British governments changed the name of Armistice Day to Remembrance Day instead, so the people who served in all wars could be remembered together. The last post, poetry, poppies and a bunch of other traditions are still important parts of the memorials that happen today. Along with places like this in the Adelaide Hills that will proudly form the centrepiece of these kids' commemorations for years to come. Well, I did have a great granddad, my mum did, and he fought in World War I. And um, I've never actually thought of him as a soldier before or as my relative. And now that there's a place here, I just find that it's easier. It makes me feel happy because um, it's a great place to meet up and it's in a good spot. It's special to me because it's a place not just to remember, but it's a place for everyone. It's not just for one subject, it's, it's sort of a place where you can do anything really. And back to the quiz now, question 11. What is it called when you use these characters to represent numbers? They're Roman numerals. All right, question 12. Which of these animals were used by soldiers during the war? If you picked pigeon, you've got it. 
Question 13. Which of these things was invented during World War I? Was it a bicycle, computers, or daylight saving? It was daylight saving. Question 14. Which of these things were banned during the war? Was it independent reporters, cameras, or both? The answer is both were banned. And finally, question 15. Where is the Australian War Memorial located today? Is it in Canberra, Sydney or Hobart? The Australian War Memorial is in Canberra. Finally today, as you saw there, poppies are an important part of Remembrance Day commemorations. So we thought we'd visit a school that spent the past few months colouring in thousands of paper poppies. Check it out. This classroom is chock full of poppies. But this isn't an art lesson. So, Lulu, can you tell me what you're doing right now, please? I'm colouring in these poppies for Remembrance Day. So, do you mind if I join you? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, why do you, know, do you know the whole poppy story, how it all started? Well, there was a man who went to Flanders Fields after the war mm -hmm. and saw the only living thing there was po red poppies. And so he wrote a poem about Flanders Fields. That man's name was Colonel John McRae. He was a Canadian medical officer and he was stationed in the area of Flanders, which is in Belgium. Near the end of 1914, one of Colonel McRae's friends was killed. When they buried him on the battlefield, Colonel McRae noticed that poppies had already started to bloom between the graves and that marked the beginning of a poem he later wrote. In Flanders' fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row. It wasn't long before that poem was world famous, and it inspired many people to use the poppy as a symbol of support for the Allied forces. They were used to fundraise for war veterans, their families, and even restoration projects to help fix areas in France that were destroyed during the war. These days, you still see them, often on people's clothing or at sites of remembrance, like war memorials. This class will use these poppies for something different, though. Emily Rose, why are you colouring in poppies today? Well, we're colouring poppies because on the at 11 o'clock on the 11th of November, um, a plane will be dropping 58,000 poppies onto one of the roads near the city, mm -hmm. and we're making them. The poppies represent the 58,000 soldiers that the Anzac soldiers that died. Mm -hmm. To add to their meaning, these girls have written messages on the back of each one. Some are about remembering the past, while other messages are the names of people who fought in the First World War. So, Eli, what are you writing on your poppy? So, I've written a quote by the Queen, which is, grief is the price you pay for love. So, what kind of messages are you writing on the back of the poppy? Well, I'm writing, like, lest we forget or hope, or names of people I know who went to war. OK. So do you know, what kind of names? Like, are they people that you researched? Um, well, my great-granddad Bill, he fought in the war, and his name's William Satchel, so I put that on a couple. Why do you guys think it's important that we commemorate Remembrance Day and think about it every year? Um, it's important to remember Remembrance Day and remember all the people who died and all the families who lost people because it's really important to understand how that affected so many people. Well, I think it's important because if they didn't fight in the war or if they didn't do what they did that time, we might be living differently to how we are right now and it could affect our lives.
I've got mine on and you can wear yours on the 11th too. Well, that brings us to the end of today's Armistice special. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.